Once again, I would like to say how happy we are to see everyone here tonight into this fortnight of our series, A City is a Place to Live for a Place of Promise. And the idea behind <clears throat> presenting these cities, there are, there are places where God's people were, but they have not been left there. They were called from these places onto a place of promise. And it is an analogy between these places and the ultimate places where we as God's children are going. So tonight we are going to be looking at the city of Babylon. Babylon is considered the city of the golden cup. And that reference is given to, to it by the Lord God himself. So what can we see tonight uh, about this place called Babylon. Now, I have done some research, and the information is very rich. It is just a drop in the bucket of what we could find, but I trust that tonight the information would be sufficient, that it would stir your interest to do even more individual studies. I would like to <clears throat> give just two corrections on the, the presentation I had last night. First of all, when I spoke concerning the king of Israel, uh, it was Jeroboam, the servant, who uh, was king of the ten tribes, and Rehoboam was the uh, son of Solomon, who was the king of the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. I reversed it last night. I also mentioned um, that Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines. It's the other way around, all right? <laughs> so those are the two corrections. So tonight, let's see what we can learn from um, Babylon. There are two Babylons presented in scripture. The one, the first one, is used as a type which enslaves God's people. And the second one, is the antitype being the final earth kingdom that will persecute God's people before Christ returns. And tonight, this presentation is going to support these two facts. All right, here we go. Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 1 to 11. Let me read. The word that came to Jeremiah the prophet Concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, The Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. And go not after other gods to serve them, to worship them, and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus said the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, said the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and an hissing, and perpetual desolations. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Now that's a mouthful of reading. What I want to bring out in the particular passage in Jeremiah, just a little background. 
The Lord God sent Jeremiah unto the nation of Israel and other nations around as well. Particularly the children of Israel, they were a backsliding people. After 480 years, they had the temple built. They were proud of it. And as many years went by, the people fall back into idol worship. And God warned them, if they do this thing, he is going to remove them from the promised land. He's just as he removed the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the otherites, he is going to remove them if they do not serve him wholeheartedly. So they backslid. And for many years, God sent prophets among them to warn them day after day after day, year after year, season after season, but they just would not hear. And God decided he is going to remove them out of the land for 70 years, and he's going to give them over into the hand of a foreign king, a king whose language, the word of God said, is a hard language. Now, on Sunday night, I made mention because um, <clears throat> Sunday night is the origin of all things. And I started with Genesis, and I said that God called Abram from Ur, the land of what? The Chaldees. And Nebuchadnezzar came from the land of Babylon, where it was a Chaldean king. So the very people out of which Abram came, it is the very nation that came hundreds of years later and enslaved them. And I want to bring out another point. The word of God here says in Jeremiah that Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant. Why is that important? What I want us to know as children of God is we like to talk a lot about favor. We like to say that God is for me and no one is against me. But I want us to also learn that as children of God, when we step out of line, God will use other people to bring us back. God will use other people to bring us into a state of hardship. God will use other people to go against us. You understand? Because God rules, God is sovereign. He used the king of Babylon and he said, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. A wicked king, you know? A wicked king and he says, he is my servant. I'm going to use him to teach you a lesson. And you're going to be there in slavery for 70 years. God is sovereign. God is over all nations. There's a song that was sung in 1978. And it's a song that I think most of us in here should be familiar with. Where when they went to Babylon, the inhabitants of Babylon heard concerning all exploits of Jerusalem, or the Israel rather, under their great king. And they had many kings and the, many songs, and the songs were joyous songs. And there's a well-known song that says, in the, by the rivers of Babylon, well, that's a verse actually, I didn't find it, but it's a verse of scripture. By the rivers of Babylon where we sat down, there we prayed when we remember Zion. The people of Babylon required of us a song, but how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I should have gotten the scripture for you, but um, I don't remember where it's taken from. But do you research and you'll find it. They couldn't sing joyously. Why? Because they were in enslavement. It's very difficult when you're in enslavement to find joy, isn't it? Word of God says, uh, I think it's in the book of uh, one of the epistles, I don't know if it's James, it says, What profit do you have? Or what joy do you have when you suffer for your faults? You don't have no joy. But you have lots of joy, or rather be joyous when you are buffeted. For when you are not wrong, they can't sing no joy. They don't have no joy because they did wrong in the sight of God and God has led them to a foreign nation to teach them a lesson. Now, what is Babylon's political identity? What does it look like? And we're going to use the scripture to paint the political identity of the kingdom of Babylon. So, <clears throat> we read from Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, we're going to read the first and the last verse of this, uh, one of the verses here of um, Daniel chapter 2. 
And the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, where his spirit was troubled and his sleep break him. Thou king, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of clay and part of iron. This is the dream, and we will tell interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the followers of heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. The dream that he had was that he saw a great image, and he couldn't remember it. And he called a bunch of people. He called a group of people, those who were his counselors. And we're going to look later at who these type of people were. None of them could have given the, the secret of what he dreamed. That was a strange request this king asked. So he sent and asked for Daniel. Daniel and his friends prayed. And that night, Daniel received a dream from God telling him what the king of Babylon dreamt. So he came and revealed to him what the dream was. This is an artist's rendition of this image that he saw. He saw the head of gold, the chest of silver, the, thigh, the, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet of clay. Feet with ten toes. And the Lord God said to him, into that dream, that he has revealed to him that he is a great and powerful king. He was a king, the greatest king of four that there was to be. He was the first in the line of kings that would rule the world until Christ returns. Babylon ruled the world for 1,300 years. That's a long time. Started from AD 606 to 561. And there are other kings that came in the line after the, the Buchanan um, the king. But the Babylon, Babylonian ruled for a long, long time. After them, you had uh, the Medes and the Persians took over, and after them, you had the Grecian Empire with Alexander the Great, and after that, you have the Roman Empire, and they were, Rome had two parts, just as Egypt had Upper and Lower Egypt, so Rome had Eastern and Western Rome. There was Eastern and Western Rome, typified by two legs, and just as you have ten toes, so the last kingdom would have a division of ten. And we're going to look later at some of the symbolism of these ten. Very interesting. And it is on two feet. Whereas you find that the kingdom is part clay and part iron, it means it has residue of the early kingdom before it, the kingdom of Rome, which was typified by iron. The latter kingdom that will come after that will have iron in it as well, which means it has residues of kingdom of Rome in it. And we're going to see some of that. God gave Babylon its power. The word of God says in the latter chapter in Daniel that I am God, I reign, and I set up and I put down who I want. Now, in the world today, there are many individuals who are hunting for power. They connive, deceive, and do all sorts of things to gain power. And one of the diabolical acts that people do to get power is they consult witchcraft. Some people have the yard rings. They are Masonic lodges all over the world. They go by different names. And the kind of people that are in these societies, you would imagine. You see people in Antigua, and they have power, and they have money, and they have businesses. And no matter how things are going bad, they're not losing. All you know, if you check them carefully, 
they have on a yarn ring on their finger because they have made covenants in secret places, in secret societies where these so-called higher spiritual powers makes a way for them for success. But that's another lesson. God gave it its power. And that's why when God spoke to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, he says, meditate in my words day and night. If you do that and you follow my word, my commandments, you will have what? Good success. People in the world today have success, but it's not good success. You check the roots of it, it's doubled in sin and error. So, Babylon gets its power from God. God said that Babylon is my servant, the beginning is my servant, and he's going to lead his people there to teach them a lesson. So, what does Babylon's spiritual identity look like? What does it look like? What does the scripture say? Uh, Babylon can be said to have a polytheocratic government as well. All the kingdoms we looked at look, look like that, which means polytheocratic means that they had many different belief systems mixed up in it. They had many different gods. Poly means a more than one. It means it's a plural, it's a plurality, whereas mono means singular. So Babylon has a polytheocratic or cosmic religion or society, or government. Cosmic from the point of view because of the kind of people that they have in it. They consulted the stars. So, in Daniel chapter 2, and you can read the entire chapter, but we're going to pick out a few verses, it tells us what does the spiritual identity of that Babylon look like. We read from Daniel chapter 2. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. These two particular scriptures shows us the kind of people that was involved in the king's kingdom. They were magicians. What do they do? They have all kinds of consultations and all kinds of omens and they make enchantments and they, maybe they have their drums and they beat their drums and they throw up some dust in the air and make all kinds of things to look as if they know what they're doing. All right? To try to interpret the king's dreams. Astrologers. These are individuals that consult the heavenly bodies. They would read stars, they would read charts, they would look up the various constellations and the various zodiacal signs that are there, Libra, maybe what Monty Barn, what we name mean, and all these kind of things to see if they can decipher what his name is. But that didn't work. Then he had sorcerers. Sorcerers are those that deal with, um, direct with spirits, demons. And they have spells that they cast as well. It's a stronger form of magic. Magic is like a fooling, mimicking of stuff. Sorcery deals directly with demons, demonic spirits, where people sell out their soul unto the devil. They consult with spirits and they would bring up the so-called dead, but it's not really the dead. It's demons that they deal directly with. And then there's this interesting term, the Chaldeans. What were the Chaldeans? Well, the Chaldeans were the individuals that came out of the Babylonian mysteries. The Babylonian mysteries had with it a secret society of priests that practiced all of these things. There is a, a secret order. There is an induction into this particular order in the Chaldean mysteries. There are different level of gods that they consult. There are different rites. There are, there is revealed and the unrevealed. There is like a secret society in the Chaldean mysteries. If you read it, you can read it in one of my resources um, by Reverend J. Hislop, The Two Babylons. You would find in that, and other sources as well, you will find in that the revelation in the history of the secret mysteries of Babylon was they have what is called a confessional. In the confessional, they would get people's secrets. What they did, they promised the people 
uh, a hope of deliverance, a hope of success. But for them to get rid of their guilt, they must tell the priest, and the priests are the only individuals that hold the truth. So when the priest comes and presents himself to you as the only holder of truth, you are now on an oath expected to reveal your secrets to him or her. And then they will take that secret, holding nothing, and they will use that and feed their hierarchy. It is that secret system that, used, that is used by many priests to hold a guilt trip. Or if you want to put blackmail many individuals into doing what they want. That secret mysticism of the Chaldean. Sound familiar? Right? Sound familiar, ain't it? Yeah, secret confessional. That's where it came from. So the Chaldeans were a group of individuals who were into mysticism out of Babylon. And these are the kind of people that he had. But who else did he have? He had the godly. He had a godly counselor too. He had Daniel. Daniel was a godly man. He was a prophet. And he sought him too for counsel. What is going on in the world today? His counselors are both godly and pagan. God wants us, according to Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. When we looked in previous nights, the same idea keep coming over in the various places that the children of Israel went. And they're not expected to stay. Today, many people are looking for counsel in all the wrong places and they're mixing it up. The governments, when, it's, when it suits them, they come to the church. They do the genie rub. They come to the church and they want a blessing. And they have a service. And they have a concert. And they have many different things. And on the back side of that, they have all kind of other counselors, ungodly men and godly people that they go to for advice. Who have no idea what they're talking about. The governments of the world today is no different. And dare any church body that say they name the name of Christ, especially from a leadership point of view, have an issue, and rather than consult God, they go to pagan counselors. Dear any individual who named the name of Christ, who say that you're a Christian and still dabble in occultic practices, looking for answers for the unknown, looking for the secrets, the unrevealed. God is the holder of secrets, and God is the revealer of secrets. The Word of God says that God does nothing before he reveal it unto his servants, the prophets. And that's why he sent prophets to them, rising early, day after day, year after year, so that they would know what to do. They'll get the message of God. What does Babylon look like? Here's some pictures of it. This is a picture I got from the internet, but I know where it came from. It comes out of the same book, Two Babylons. I found this, and because I knew it, I... I I put it there. The picture shows that <clears throat> this individual king goes to a priest for a blessing. And behind is a woman with a cup. It's a golden cup, actually. It's a picture of a woman holding a golden cup. It is in black and white, but the idea is of what the practices they have. They have a golden cup, and every individual. One of the things that was said concerning the Chaldean mysteries is that every initiate must drink of a particular beverage. It's called uh, the mystery beverage. And every initiate, it uh, partakes of it. It has in it water, honey, and I think flour and other things in it. Now they tell you it's water, honey, and other things, but they don't tell you what the other things are. It represents the revealed, what they tell you, and the unrevealed, but they don't tell you. And then you drink it, and the person becomes intoxicated or drunken. And then, just like what the Africans do today when they beat their drums and they drink their intoxicated um, beverages, and they beat their drums, and they go off in the spirit, and they hallucinate. Right? It's like a hallucinating drug. And that's what they give the initiates out of a golden cup. 
So the word of God said in Jeremiah 51 verse 7 that Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hands. God called him that. That is why we refer to them tonight as Babylon the golden cup. And it's very important, the symbolism of the golden cup. And some of you are already putting two, 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 two together and you know I'm going with this. All right, so this is one of the first pictures of what Babylon looks like. These are some of the Chaldean symbols. These go back thousands of years. These are present symbols. Thousands of years. Anything look familiar? This one over here is the sun. That's the moon over there. This set over here, this is the symbol of cancer. It looks like yin and yang. That's what it is. That's what it represents. This is the, what do you call that? Alpha sign. That's it right there. And it's in various symbols. This is like the sign of the man or woman, something like that. And if you, when you go through, and the others I did not put here for sake of space, you are going to find that these symbols and others are dotted throughout not only the form of Babylon, but the Babylon that is future to this one. Okay? And we're going to look at some of those. So these are the symbols. I'm leaving it there for a while because I want you to familiarize yourself with some of it. Uh, one of them is the ankh. I didn't, I didn't have that symbol there. It's, it, this symbol is very interesting. This represents like a sun. And you're going to see that particular symbol in the later Babylon. This one as well. And this one. Okay, I want you to familiarize yourself. All right, now the Chaldean symbols came from their practices. They represent zodiacal signs, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Scorpio, Pisces, etc., etc., etc. They represent in Chaldean, and if you look in the Chinese zodiac, some of the symbols are there as well. So it is not only for the Chaldean, but it has gone forward centuries beyond that time. And some of them mean different things today. This particular one, almost shaped like Baphomet, the goat head. All right? And some of these shapes and so on are used in analogy in other things. So what does Babylon look like? Babylon worshipped a god that was called Dagon. Dagon was a fish god. Okay? That's an artist rendition of it. This is an actual discovery of the god Dagon seen depicted over here wearing a fish hat. And this is, I did this picture so that you can see clearly what the priests wore. The priests of Dagon wore a fish hat on their head, representing uh, uh, that who they are worshipping, who they are servicing. What does Babylon look like? Here's another picture of the Babylonian priest. The Chaldean priest gives a blessing by sprinkling water on the initiates. And that's what this Babylonian fish, Dagon priest, fish, um, priest is doing. He has this water in his hand representing holy water. And he is sprinkling the initiates, sprinkling them, initiating them. And this is over 3,000 years old, this practice here. Right? Nothing new. So that's what the former Babylon looked like. This is a picture of the Babylonian goddess Lilith. She has in her hand something that looked like the same picture we saw earlier, the ank, and she has owls around her. She is said to be the hunter of souls of men and women while they sleep. This goddess Lilith. And it is because of this goddess Lilith where we get lullaby. It is said at nights when the children go to sleep, so to prevent Lilith, the hunt of souls to come and steal their children away or the souls away, they sing lullabies. Lullaby, you know? Yeah. That's where the idea comes from. Comes from a, a Chaldean, a Babylonian origin when it's God Lilith. Wow, it's a lot of things you learn when you when you do some research, huh? Are you still gonna sing lullabies to your children and your grandchildren when they, when they can't sleep at night? You don't need to do that. But that's their belief. Babylonian mother and child God. Interesting. This mother and child God represents Samarimus and Tammuz. Tammuz was Nimrod. 
Samaris was his wife. Samaris was the wife of Cush. And Nimrod, the son, married his mother, Samaris, and was reborn. And this relief, this picture represents, is actually a stone um, cut out, right? This is an artist's rendition of it. It represents Samaris and Tammuz. I want to familiarize yourself with it. It's called by many other names throughout various other uh, religions in the world, all right? Um, the Black Madonna is one of them. All right, so you have this Babylonian mother and child represented. This is also what the Babylon of Scripture, the first Babylon, looked like. The king of Babylon's name reflected the belief in the protection of the gods, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebu or Nebo, the first part of his name, is a representation of the god Mercury, the god of dreams. So no wonder God gave him a dream, a very important dream. If you have your name as representing a god of dreams, Mercury, and perhaps too, because Lilith was also one of the gods in their day, it was a common name for him to be named Nebuchadnezzar. He named his son Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, Belshazzar, after the goddess Beltis. But he was named Nebuchadnezzar. And that itself is a merging of the name of the gods that they believed in. So he believed that the god of dreams would give him a vision, would give him uh, um, prosperity. So God gave him a dream, dream of all dreams, a dream that would show him from his time and right down to the end of the world. This name change is reflected in from Daniel to Belteshazzar, from the goddess Beltis, queen of the gods. I want to encourage us in a particular observation. When the king of Babylon took God's people that he allowed them to have, one of the first things the king did is to change the name. Change the name. And the name represents the kingdom in which they are. I'm encouraging every one of us to know your name. What is your identity? What is the name that God call you? Know your name. When you get wrapped up as an individual, a man or woman of God, into world systems, one of the things that you begin to do is you begin to lose your identity. You begin not to know who you are. But as you continue to read in Daniel, he keep calling him, and Daniel, and Daniel said that. that the scarce he used the name Belteshazzar. His name was Daniel. What is your ID? They go, they go by many different ID. Believers, Christians, born again, and many others. Some people call it spiritual Israel. Some people call it the seed of Abraham. You get that the last scripture in Ephesians, I think it's chapter 3, at the end of it, the word of God says, not all Israel is Israel who is born after the flesh, but those who are born after the faith like Abraham. If you are Abraham's seed, or rather the scripture says, if you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed. So you can call yourself Abraham's seed by faith if you want. But we go by many different names. What does God call you? One of the things that my children come home from day to day and tell me is that people call them names. I say, you don't worry about that. You know who you are. And one of the things you have to tell our children as they grow up is to know who they are. You find in the world today many individuals are changing over their sexes, their identity. Men want to become women. They dress like them, talk like them, take the hormones. Because the world is telling them it's okay. And they're passing laws to say it's all right. Changing your identity from man to woman, woman to man. Romans warns us that God is going to judge all these people who change the glory of God into an abomination. Men, we have to learn to love our bodies. And women, love the body that God gives you. The state of being that God placing you sufficient to glorify him. We are made in the image of the one true and living God. Try not to change your identity from what God gave you. Know who you are. 
Be watchful of those who will try to change it. Be watchful of those who will try to change you, to change your idea from what God called you into something else. What does a Latter-day Babylon look like? All right, we looked at the first Babylon. Now, what does the other one look like? Hmm. We read the scripture, Revelation chapter 17. And uh, this is the prophet John getting a revelation from God as the end, to the end times. What's going to happen? We read from chapter 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. This is a real picture rendition of the woman who rides the beast. So who is this beast? Who, who is this woman? The Bible tells you what it looks like. It tells you it's a woman and a beast, but then we need more information than that. Where is this latter Babylon? Where is it? How can you find it in Scripture? The Bible doesn't tell us much about the later Babylon. The only reference you have is what you find in Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18. So we're going to look and see where is this Babylon. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast and repeated that for a particular purpose. Full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet color, decked with gold, precious stones, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and fornications of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, where is this beast? And the angel said unto me, wherefore this thou marvel? Why am I so surprised for? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Try and remember that. The seven heads that the beasts have represent seven mountains. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The woman is a city. The woman is a city. So where is it? Where is the city that sits on seven hills? Where is the city that rules and controls and influences the world? Where is the city that is decked in purple and fulfills what God says is an abomination? Where is it? Only one place for that. One, you can choke all this, you can agree with me, you can sue me, you can anything you want. Only one place in history fit that, and that is Rome. Remember the image that Daniel saw, oh, nearly 3,000 years ago. The feet that had ten toes represented or has a residue of the kingdom that was before it, which is the, king, the Roman Empire. So, the kingdom that comes after, the kingdom that's going to run the world until Christ comes back, also has in it residues of Rome. This is a picture of members of the Roman Empire. You see the fish out of Dagon? All the popes wear that. That's the same fish hat that the priests wore 
for the Dagon king, which suggests that this system of mysticism is an ecumenical system. And that's a very popular word today, ecumenicanism, or however you want to pronounce it. The world churches are being encouraged to come together as one. It's a world council, and under the head, the Pope of the RCC, the Roman Catholic Church, all of these churches are coming together. And I wish I had the video to show you where you had lots, I would say lots, it's actually more than 20 of them, representative church heads that came. And there he was, not the present Pope, and all of them came up and they bowed and the kisses ring. All of them. Different churches, Orthodox churches, Protestant churches, Lutheran churches, lots of them. I was looking to see if any Brethren church was there, but I didn't see any. <laughs> I did. And I wish I had the video. I didn't want it to stalk. I wanted to actually show it to you. But it's very interesting. Go on YouTube and look for it. You might find it there. But here is a fish hat representing the Babylonian or the Chaldean system of the Dagon fish priests worshiping him. Remember the sundial I showed you concerning the symbols? Well, here it is right there. The sun disks came from Babylon, Chaldean. In the first Babylon, from Chaldean, it's in the present day Babylon, the one that is there. Now, here's this particular bishop, cardinal, or who is he? Wearing, having this cross. The cross represents yin and yang. This is one of their relics, one of their, their, their symbols. It represents symbol as above, so below. That's what yin and yang represents. It represents the balance between a positive and negative. Those of you who know karate or watch a lot of it, like I used to do sometimes, would know that. Black and white. In the RCC, and from hence when I say RCC, I, rep I mean the Roman Catholic Church. In the RCC, you have two popes. Many of you don't know that. The white pope, which is what everybody sees, and there's a black pope that's just in black, that is a head of the militant arm of the church. The RCC has a militant arm. What's, what's it called again? The Jesuits. The present pope was the former head of the Jesuit order. Present pope. So the yin and yang represents that, black and white. And the yin and yang is one of the emblems that represents mysticism in the oriental countries, China and so, very much known for that. It is also one of the Chaldean uh, symbols that we saw earlier. So what does the president of Babylon look like? They were decked in purple. That's what you read, you read the scripture for yourself. Do you know of any other church or in the whole world that just like that? None. And their particular colors are scarlet and purple. That's what the scriptures say. There's no other group on earth that fit that. If you find it, I give you $10,000. I have to save up for it, but I find it, then I give it to you. I, see, I'm committing myself to what you don't have. Can I can find it. So this Babylon today that the scripture talks about, that is going to rule that... Um, that, that John saw in Revelation is decked in purple and scarlet. And here is one of their relics. The Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. Does it really represent Virgin Mary and baby Jesus? No. It represents the goddess Samaritans and Tammuz. That's where it comes from. It's ecumenical in nature. They embody or they embrace world religions. Because they say you must have positive and negative. You know, like magnet, positive and negative attract. They do not want to leave out no one. So they embrace all religions. Nothing is left out. And they're going to seek to bring the whole world into one. And that is what they want because the Pope must be seen as all in all. He is said to be uh, the God's pontiff, or he pontificates, or he makes laws and rules, and he's seen as God on earth. And that's abominable. Right? 
So there's Virgin Mary, just baby, Virgin Mary and Jesus that they worship. And God says to worship him only. You know, they're worshiping someone that they see. When God appeared to um, Moses, the word of God says that he did not appear to him in any form. So nobody know what God shaped like. And he did that because he did not want them to have any symbolic representation and say that this is God and worship it. As human beings are very weak. We are individuals who think more in the flesh. We move more by what we see, what we feel, what we touch. And God says to us that we are people of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. So they want to always have an image in front of you that you can see and, and feel and touch and worship. Hence you have images of baby Jesus. One of the relics as well that they use is the beads. What do they call the beads again? The thing, the rosary? That also is very common amongst the Buddhist religion. Each bead actually represents a demon. So if it's 26 of them, it represents 26 different demons. And the priests in the RCC have them, the rosary. People have them at home. And they have the prayer and they have the rosary and they're doing it, counting it one by the next. And Buddhists do that as well. Or rather, should I say, monk, Buddhist monks do that as well. So I want to encourage us. Do not lose sight. Do not lose track of what's going on in the world in this religion. It's here. It's amongst us. The word of God tells us what it looks like. So how long will this particular kingdom last? The Babylon that is spoken of in Revelation. How long will this new Babylon last? Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came from the sea, diverse one from another. Verse 7. And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had a great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Hmm, similar, isn't it? And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of one of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth, that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. This is the interpretation of the dream that Daniel got now in chapter 7. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse or unique, you know, different than all the others. This is a unique kingdom. And shall devour the whole earth. And shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. That's something similar to what is in Revelation we just read. I was speaking to a, a Christian brother years ago, a few years ago. And he said to me, you know, Revelation is a total new set of, of, um, of, 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 of revelation in anything of God. Total new prophecy. Nothing like that exists. He never read this. But he read it, he didn't make the analogy, he didn't make the connection. And I will show you later by references how both Babylons are very similar. So here we find that this kingdom, another shall rise after them and shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. And he, the horn, that little horn that goes up, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall weigh out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Oh my. This future king that's coming is going to change times and laws. What did the first king in early Babylon do? He changed the name. And he changed laws too. 
When he made a great image, so they didn't worship him. This is the decree, and he sent it out to the whole nations that when you hear the sackbut and the harp and the psaltery and all these things, what do you do? You follow and worship that image. Change laws. This kingdom also, this king will change laws. And they shall be given into his hand. Who they? The saints shall be given into his hand until the time and times and dividing of times. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. Praise the Lord. Them same saints that this kingdom murder and kill. Then the scripture says the martyrs that we read in chapter 17 Revelation that the blood of all the saints is in her. That same kingdom that the ruling and the hugging and have death with riches and they don't even have the value. That kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints. A name. Are we saints? Amen. You're a saint? Amen. The Bible calls us saints. It's saints, those of us who name the name of Christ. And by the way, this is Daniel, right? Jesus didn't come yet. So you can't say that the word saints represent a present day ID. It's way back then. Even in Isaiah, you read that what? No weapons form against you shall prosper and every tongue rise up against you thou shalt get them. For this is what? The heritage of the saints. So the idea of the saints is way back then. A saint is just an individual who is converted into a certain ideology or belief. So the saints that was killed and murdered, what they have, they're going to be huffed. When God conquered Jericho and they did an unusual thing, God said to them, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, the iron is mine, the brass is mine. Put it in my treasure house. When God wins battles, he huff. And when he takes over this kingdom, he will huff the kingdom. And he will give it to who? The people of the saints. Bless the Lord. Whose kingdom is what? An everlasting kingdom. And all the minions shall serve him forever. All the minions shall serve that king, when he takes over the kingdom that this king is reigning, I have type and anti-type of the two Babylons. I'm going to look at some of them. It's very interesting. I have all the scriptures there to prove what is being said. And if you want to take a note, or if you want to get a, a DVD of it that has been recorded, you can go over and look and check all of these scriptures. I know a certain sister that if there's anything wrong, she's going to let me know. So I research and make sure that these are right. Okay? What does the Babylon, the first Babylon that enslaved God's people, what do you have to say about that? That Babylon is a type, and the Babylon that was supposed to come after that is the anti-type, which means that one, the first one, stands in reference to the one that should come after. All right? Type and anti-type. So the type, Babylon, first Babylon, it was a world power. Daniel 2, verse 37. In uh, Revelation 17, 8, that city also reigns. It's a world power. Second one, it sits in many waters. Babylon the type. Jeremiah 51, 13. In Revelation 17, the horse sits where? On many waters. It represents nations and tongues and peoples and languages. Type Babylon is considered a golden cup. Jeremiah 51 7, Revelation 17. This whore, this woman has what in her hand? A golden cup. The drunken nations, all the nations are drunken by her, drinking her wine. Jeremiah 51 7 in Revelation, the word of God says that all the nations are drunk by the fornication. What is fornication? What does fornication mean? Fornication stands for illicit. Uh, relations. Relations that you should not have. So the, the nations of the world are having illicit relationship with this Babylon. And so they are drinking in, it means it talks about doctrines, it, the emerging doctrines. So when the doctrines and then the nations of the world commit fornication with this, they become drunken. Just as in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, they, that Babylon the type, slay God's people. 
51 verse 49 of Jeremiah. And in Revelation 17, it says that the blood of all the saints and the martyrs is in her. Chapter 18 verse 24 says that in her is the blood of the prophets and saints. So this antitype Babylon, the one that is reigning, because we see the pictures, so we know that it's there today, because it's going to rain until Christ comes. That Babylon, in her, has the blood of the martyrs, the saints, and prophets. That Babylon there, this present one, the one that's ruling right now, have been a murderous engine over hundreds of years. And by the way, a question. How long has this Babylon, the one in Revelation, how long has it been reigning? But you have an idea? When the church was born, after Christ returned to um, heaven, maybe A.D. Uh, 34, 33, I don't know, somewhere around there, the word of God <clears throat> said that he received up into heaven. 50 days later, in the day of Pentecost, that is 50 days later after um, the uh, Passover, you had what's called Pentecost, and the Spirit of God came down like cloven tongues on the head. The church was born then. That is when the church was born. But secondly, history tells us that according to the RCC, their church was born or founded upon Peter, and that God instituted the Roman Catholic Church. But history would teach us otherwise, because it was Constantine, uh, way back then, uh, I think it's in what, AD 300, thereabout, that instituted, they, they tried to kill the Christians, they martyred them on the Rome, Roman Empire, killed the Christians, they ran from place to place, you read that in Hebrews chapter 11, the halls of faith, they were killed, they were martyred, they were fed to animals, they were hung upside down, they were burned to the stake. And in the name of Christ. And many years later they were called the Crusades or the Crusaders for Christ. And under the, a Roman cross, they slaughtered millions of people. Millions of people. In recent times, recent popes have given apologies for it. That they were sorry. They apologized that they did it. Not me, I, I have the clip. Go find it on YouTube. Everything is there. They apologize for what they did. They have slain the saints. All the blood of the saints is in her. What else about type and type? The first Babylon, the people were called out. They were called out, say, get out of her. I'm going to visit vengeance upon her in Jeremiah. In Revelation 18, verse 4, God says, Come out of my people, that you've been a partaker of the judgment and plague that's going to be brought upon her. That's future. Why is it that God has to say, Come out of her, my people? Because it's people in there. God has inside of this antitype Babylon, the one that's ruling right now, God's people is in there because when the churches go back, the heads of the churches go back and they bow down their knee to the earthly pontiff, the pontiffus maximus, God on earth, and they accept his dictates. They take it back to their churches and they must do what he say. You understand? And many individuals who don't understand what they're doing, they say, God bless the Pope, he's a good man. He's a righteous man. Last year we look at feasts and festivals. And many of the festivals were introduced by this church, this system. One of them is Christmas. One of them is Easter. That's going to take place next month. And many of us are going to observe Lent and all eat fish. Subjugating ourselves to the fornication that this system introduces. And we don't understand why we're doing it. We've lost history. But many of us is in there. God says to come out. Come out of my people. Don't stop in there. He would not tell his people to come out if they were not in it. So be warned. We must understand the system. We must not um, be sympathetic to the system because it will change you. 
That's what Babylon is all about. It says in Isaiah that Babylon, that enslaved God's people, it says in Isaiah 47 verse 8, I am no widow. I do not know the loss of children. And what does the present day Babylon say? Revelation 18, 7, they say the same thing. I have no, I am no widow. I will know no sorrow. God says, no, you said that. You are going to have sorrow. In one day, your destruction shall come. He says it about both of them. What else? God says he will burn Babylon with fire. Isaiah 47, 14. In Revelation 18, that Babylon will be burnt with fire. The merchant shall mourn in Isaiah 47, 15. The first Babylon, the type. The merchant shall mourn when God will burn it to fire. For they have lived delicately. They have lived um, sumptuously. They have gained much. What is said in Revelation 18? That the merchants will stay from afar and they will mourn. They will mourn when they see the destruction of that Babylon. God takes revenge on her in Jeremiah 51. Because of what they did to God's people. God said, I will take revenge on Babylon. That's why he said to come out. And in Revelation 18, he says, I will take revenge on her. I will take revenge on her. Why? Because of she has committed sorcery. She has deceived the nations with her witchcraft. And God is going to bring down judgment upon this Babylon. What okay, have we learned tonight so far? Is that the first Babylon that was shown is no different from the one that is in the past. And I want to encourage us tonight that, and do your research, that the Lord will not hold us guiltless if we do not for our own selves read and understand what is it he wants us to know of the times and season in which we're in. God has placed watchmen amongst us in the different nations. And the purpose of those watchmen is to warn God's people. These watchmen are you and I who are sent throughout the nations. These watchmen are pastors, their elders, their mothers, their fathers. And you and I are supposed to, everywhere we go, tell the people of the system that we're in. There's a new world order coming. And this new world order will seek to enslave the minds of people. Oh, it's not going to be the same kind of slavery that way was way back then. You're not going to see a little chain and a rope on you. But just like in Jeremiah, where God, or Ezekiel rather, sorry, God sealed the forehead of his servants. So you find in Revelation a sealing, Satan sealed too. All those who are in his kingdom, they will bear the number of his name. What is it? 666. It's not a literal number you will see. But it's also on the forehead and on the right arm. The forehead represents your will and the arm represents your servitude. And we are not to be serving no other kingdom in no other kingdom than the kingdom of God. No other kingdom than the kingdom of God. No other king than King Jesus. And I want to encourage us here tonight. If there's anyone here who's unsaved and you are not under the one true righteous king of kings and the lord of lords, one day you're going to bow down and you're going to reverence him. Everyone that goes and meets that king, that um, king of Babylon today, must bow down. They must bow down and they must kiss his ring. Everybody does it. You will see clips of Obama does it. You will see Fidel Castro does it. Remember, he's a, remember uh, Obama is a democratic. Fidel Castro is what? Socialist. The Chinese do it. They bow down to the same Pope. They are communists. And all the leaders of kings in the nations do it. And that's what Revelation say. All the kings, all the leaders of the earth do it. When the last election took place in Antigua and Barbuda, um, when was it, five years ago? We had a representation from the little great city that's really at Seven Hills. And they came and they gave their credentials to our prime minister here in Antigua and Barbuda. So that little city 
that rain at seven hills, they have a representation here. Go back and read the newspapers, you will find it. It was there, it was a headline for all to see. And take is not out of the loop. And so neither are all the countries that are in the world. I said to us, be careful who we allow to become our master. As I reiterate again, ye are servants to whom you yield yourselves to obey. But is this the kingdom we're looking for? No. We are looking for a kingdom that's to come. And tomorrow night, we are going to leave Babylon behind. And we are going to look at the new Jerusalem. The one that is promised for us. The one that no one can take over. The one that will not enslave us. But we are going to, as according to Daniel chapter 12, we are going to shine as the stars forever. Will you be there? I give you an invitation. If you want to be there, you need to subject your will and you need to subject your force, your strength to the one true of living God. One true God, the God of all gods, and be born again. If you're here tonight and you profess to be a child of God, but you're fooling around, the people especially have to do that. But it's not there alone. Give them a break because some old people have to do the same thing too. Fool around, one foot in and one foot out. If you're here tonight and you're doubling, one foot is in the kingdom of God, and yet you're in Babylon, and you're mixing up in the world system, you better come out. You need to know on which ground you stand. You need to make your calling and election sure. You need to be ensure that you are a child of God, that you are in the right kingdom, that when Jesus Christ comes, you will meet him as a smiling savior and not as a judge. Good night. Thanks for coming, and may God bless you.